Uh, thanks, Richard, for uh, organizing the meeting and all of you for coming. Now, Richard just mentioned this book I published in 2003. I went back and checked that book. The last chapter is about climate change, and I checked about whether I mentioned geoengineering in that book, because I knew about it. I never mentioned it. So why are we talking about it now? Oh, it's very clear. The reason we're talking about this now is that the world has done nothing to limit atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases. Well, they've done a lot. There have been a lot of meetings. <laughs> And there are going to be more meetings, and they're coming up now, moving toward, they're in Bonn, I think, right now, uh, uh, negotiating, and, and they'll be returning to Paris um, uh, very soon. We had uh, two, uh, the two co-chairs from Paris here a little while ago in a panel that Michael participated in with me, and uh, I asked them, I looked at uh, the text that had been negotiated in Geneva, it's a, very, it's a draft, it's full of brackets, uh, but the only thing I could see in there that was novel was um, mention of uh, including a review process. So countries are going to basically declare what they're going to do in terms of reducing emissions, and then there's going to be some kind of process. Basically, all this is meant to facilitate naming and shaming. And I asked the two co-chairs if they thought this review process would make a difference. These are the co-chairs for the meeting. And they said, here, no. So this is why we're here talking about geoengineering. It's because we're not getting a grip on the problem of climate change. Now, my opening slide here uh, shows you a, a cover of a famous book that's a work of fiction. But I think it's uh, not a bad way to start thinking about this problem of geoengineering because it's so novel and unprecedented. And we are talking about the potential use of a technology that would change the relationship that humans have with nature. And I don't think we should do that lightly. Uh, there are a lot of people modeling not just the atmospherics of geoengineering, but also the governance side. And uh, in many ways, I think it's a bit early days uh, to be doing that. Uh, I think that when you think about geoengineering, it's helpful to compare it to the alternatives. It's cheaper. I'm glad I didn't say it was cheap, Alan. Uh, but it's, it's cheaper than, than reducing emissions to the point where you can stabilize concentrations. It's quicker. And of course, when I say geoengineering, I mean the reflecting particles, uh, reflecting light away by the means of, of particles, in the, mainly in the stratosphere is how I'm thinking of this. Uh, it'd be quick, quicker. Um, it has, but it has a different effect on radiative forcing, so it's not going to do the same thing. It's really important to understand. It's not a perfect substitute for not putting something in the atmosphere that wasn't there before. <laughs> okay, it's not the same thing. Um, it can control global mean temperature, potentially, but it can't preserve the spatial distribution of temperature, so it's not going to result in, in the same kind of climate that we're used to. It can't pre preserve the temperature, the precipitation, and sea level all at the same time independently. There are known risks, although I would point out there are also risks associated with cutting emissions. Uh, for example, a number of people are worried about uh, nuclear power. And there are, of course, unknown risks that people are worried about. Uh, let's compare geoengineering with another thing we could do, uh, uh, adaptation. Both can be done unilaterally. That's very important. The world is very good at doing things that are unilateral, whether those things are good for all of us or not. The world's very good at doing those things. Uh, geoengineering is unlike adaptation, though. It would have global consequences. Uh, now, there's a lot of interest in having adaptation uh, financed by rich countries for poor countries, but you have to ask, what incentive do the rich countries have to provide that kind of assistance? Um, and, and one thing to bear in mind about geoengineering is if it were used for rich countries, it would also alter the climate, possibly for the better, possibly for the worse, but for poorer countries. Adaptation is very different. Adaptation compartmentalizes the world. Let's compare geoengineering with uh, direct air capture. Air capture gets at the root cause of the problem. Much better for that reason. It's actually the only true backstop technology we have for addressing climate change but it would be very slow. 
and it would be costly. We don't know exactly how much, and I think we should be doing a lot more research into that, but it would be more costly, as I've understood, both technologies than the uh, reflective particles. Uh, and because it would be more costly, you would need a number of countries to cooperate together to finance this massive project. And that means that there would be less of a governance problem because the whole thing wouldn't happen unless you had countries collaborating together to finance the project. Um, and there are storage issues, uh, Richard mentioned in the introduction, storage in rocks, uh, which would not be a uh, risk, but there are other means of storage that, that could potentially be of risk. Uh, what are some of the objections to geoengineering? Uh, one thing to bear in mind about geoengineering is that we are already doing it. Uh, we just don't call it geoengineering. So if you think about reflective particles, uh, there's a paper um, by Ramanathan and Feng uh, arguing that half the warming associated with the rise in atmospheric concentrations of greenhouse gases is being covered up, masked by uh, aerosols, uh, particularly over China, uh, which tells you, by the way, that if China cleans up that air pollution, there'll be a release of heat. Um, my point is that we're, we, we're already doing things that through reflective particles uh, that we're not doing deliberately, but that are affecting the climate, and people aren't very upset about that. And why should we take something we're doing deliberately as being very different? And I want to emphasize this because there's a, a, the way in which people approach this problem I find is fascinating. You may be like me, you probably are, at least in this one respect. When I first heard of this idea, I thought, this is crazy. <laughs> this is insane. Um, and the more I think about it, and it's taken me a long time, I've started to look at it uh, differently. Uh, and in particular, I've started looking into this question that has intrigued also uh, people in the philosophical area and in psycho psychology about uh, how we are concerned about something we do that's inadvertent and has a consequence versus something that's deliberate and has a consequence. And it turns out that we, this is how we're, we are engineered, we uh, have an aversion towards making certain changes uh, that are deliberate. And I think that's partly what's going on with geoengineering. And I, for me, I think that's uh, an emotional response, which I understand and which I share myself, but I would hope that we would make decisions about something this monumental uh, based on rational thinking. Uh, the, uh, toward the bottom of Alan's list of uh, problems with this approach was an idea called the moral hazard problem, which basically means that even if we just knew about ge uh, geoengineering as a possibility to address this problem, we won't bother to address it properly. Um, I, there are a number of things I wanted to say about this. This is normally, Alan didn't emphasize this, but this is often the complaint that's often made about, uh, emphasized about geoengineering. First of all, this is not a correct use of the term. That won't interest most of you, so I'm not going to explain why. <laughs> it doesn't matter. Uh, it could actually be an optimal thing to do in the sense that if geoengineering worked, it actually would be better not to waste a lot of money on reducing emissions, notwithstanding all the other problems. There are a lot of other problems. It's not a perfect substitute, so don't get me wrong. But still, uh, letting off a little bit on reducing emissions might be a good thing to do. Uh, the fear that others might geoengineer in a way that you don't like might actually cause you to divert more resources towards reducing emissions. There's a colleague I have, uh, Johannes Erpelein in, in, in political science, who has argued this. Um, the main point I would make about this, the free riding problem to reduce emissions of greenhouse gases is so powerful that I believe that the knowledge of geoengineering has had virtually no effect at all on human behavior. And the reason that, that all the negotiations in the past, uh, Kyoto and Copenhagen and the next one in Paris and so on, the reason they haven't added up to, to much has nothing to do with people thinking there's a quick fix. So I don't think this is a non-issue, but the last thing I'll say about it is also an issue we can't do anything about. We do know about this technology, so we have to accept this. The other one that, was, that, that Alan mentioned is the sometimes called the termination problem. So if we start using it and we moderate the temperature, what happens if we stop using it? And uh, this is alarming because uh, temperature would rise very quickly. On the other hand, I think precisely because temperature would rise very quickly, it's probably unlikely we would stop using it. Um, now, some people have argued, well, it could be a catastrophe that would force us, in a sense, to stop using it. But if the catastrophe were local, 
This form of geoengineering, as I've understood it, is easy enough, someone else could do it. And if the catastrophe is truly global, then at that point I think we'd have bigger problems to worry about. So I'm not sure I'm bothered by either of those criticisms. All right, so what do we do? There are four options that um, I could uh, I'll mention here. One is we could just ban doing it. We just don't do it at all. And there's an environmental group, in, I think, based in Canada that has argued that. By the way, the web page, their web page that argues we should not do a geoengineering does not explain what we are going to do about climate change or what the risks are of climate change. I think that's very important. There's another group, and this is headed up uh, by uh, 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 climatologists at the University of Cambridge uh, called the Methane Emergency Group. And they're very afraid of uh, methane release in the um, Arctic. And uh, they think we should use geoengineering now and on a massive scale, because they're worried about this risk of so-called runaway climate change, which my understanding of the scientific literature uh, is that, that other people are not concerned about this. The literature as a whole is not concerned about it. Um, so those are two kind of polar extremes. Uh, there's another view that we should do the research uh, development demonstration in some, in some way now for possible use in the future, and, and often uh, the idea of an emergency is mentioned. And finally, there's the idea that Alan mentioned uh, of David Keith, which, which, that we should sort of manage this. We sort of gently add some particles. We have some cooling effect. And meanwhile, he's having us bring down uh, emissions. Uh, and my response to that would be, well, uh, if we find the particles are working, why would we bother to bring down emissions? Or to put it differently, why would we be more inclined to control emissions when we're using geoengineering than when we weren't using it? Because remember, we're not doing it now. So I don't find that very compelling. Uh, okay, geoengineering governance. Who, who decides whether this should be used, how it should be used, when it should be used, and so on and so forth? That, I think, is a central uh, question. Um, and the reason it's so important is because the economics, I wrote an article about this many years ago, the economics of this form of geoengineering are incredible. They're incredible because they're cheap, or I'll say cheaper, they're, they're cheap, at least as I've understood this technology. I'm sure we could find ways to make it, make it expensive, by the way. But still, compared to the alternative of limiting emissions, um, this technology would be cheap. If it weren't, it wouldn't be such a, a problem for, for governance. And it can be done unilaterally. A single country could do it. Uh, by the way, it, that country does not have to be the United States. <laughs> there are lots of countries with the capability to do this. And given that it probably won't be done for quite some time, the number of countries capable of doing this is going to get greater and greater. And I think as we think about the, the, um, the governance issues, there are two big problems. And one is that we might use it when we shouldn't. That's the one that most of us think about. But I think there's another risk, and the risk is we don't use it when we should. And that's why I emphasized earlier this issue about whether our action to use it is deliberate or not. Well, uh, uh, Michael kindly said I, I knew a lot about international agreements, and I do, but we don't really have any on geoengineering, and that's why I started off with the book of fiction. I don't think we know very much, um, so let me just give you some real-world analogies that at least get close to us and help to think about it a little bit. Uh, one I'll mention is the testing of nuclear weapons. Uh, the first test ban treaty, called the Partial Test Ban Treaty, one aspect of this is that every country in the world was open, uh, invited to be a signatory. Um, but a number of countries chose not to participate. Those are the countries that decided they wanted to test their weapons. And the countries that did organize the uh, treaty, the United States, the Soviet Union, and the United Kingdom, they moved on from above ground testing to below ground testing. Um, the next uh, uh, nuclear test ban treaty, the comprehensive, uh, another test ban treaty, the comprehensive test ban treaty was trying to address this by making sure that the testing, all kinds of testing, um, above or below the surface were banned, uh, and that the treaty would only en enter into force if all the nuclear-capable states uh, ratified the treaty. Well, what's happened is, uh, for, the, uh, for the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, is a number of the nuclear states have not ratified. Of course, that includes the United States, but other states as well. So therefore, the treaty has not entered into force. It is not working. So you have a partial test ban treaty that um, limited the freedom of action of countries in the treaty. They were not going to use uh, above-ground testing anyway. 
um, and didn't restrict the actions of the ones who uh, did want to use it. And then you have a comprehensive test ban treaty, which in the end has not really had much effect on limiting um, uh, testing anywhere. Another example is from uh, global positioning. So the U.S. has this global positioning system you are aware of. Uh, it makes it available to the world for free. But other countries are uh, concerned that the U.S. retains the right to shut it off or control it uh, in times of conflict. And uh, it's not surprising that China and uh, India are developing their own forms of uh, uh, global navigation, uh, but also our allies, the European Union. They don't trust the United States. And um, now what's happening is you're going to have these different technologies in, the, uh, in, the, um, in orbit, and the, uh, the different parties are collaborating to coordinate their use of all these different satellites, so you actually can improve both systems. And I think this is what might happen with geoengineering, that what might happen is there won't be one person flipping the switch, which is how I think a lot of us have implicitly thought about it, but rather there'll be quite a few because no one's going to trust the one who has his or her control of the switch. And therefore, the international agreement may not be just to restrain countries from acting, but also to coordinate the actions they take. Another thing is interesting, there is a committee, so this is a kind of a loose governance system on the, um, on the, on the, on the GPS. It, the only members of the committee are the countries that have their own systems. So of course, there's a small number of powerful states. But uh, there is, um, this was established, this committee was established under the auspices of the United Nations. And the developing countries are given a voice. They're not given a say, but they're given a voice. And the, the countries with these technologies are actually assisting these countries, the developing countries, to uh, integrate the global positioning systems with their own technologies on the ground. I think the analog for geoengineering would be that there might be assistance on adaptation, where you would coordinate adaptation on the ground with use of geoengineering in the atmosphere and possibly elsewhere. Uh, and the final example I'll give you is human cloning. Uh, there was an effort to negotiate a treaty against uh, human reproductive cloning. Uh, but when this was uh, being developed, uh, the U.S. and other countries uh, insisted that another treaty be negotiated, uh, or that the treaty include a, a restriction on therapeutic cloning. Well, the world is pretty unanimous in its support for a ban on reproductive cloning, but there is no agreement worldwide on a restriction on therapeutic cloning. And by requiring that the agreement cover both forms of cloning, the consequence was we don't have a treaty at all. There are no restrictions at all. And I think the lesson there is that if you're going to negotiate, because that blue is hard to see, if you're going to negotiate a treaty that is very restrictive, the countries that are most inclined to want to use that technology are simply not going to participate. The treaty won't be effective. So pulling this all together, uh, geoengineering may be bad. I think most of us don't enjoy the prospect of geoengineering, uh, but the alternative may be worse. This is extremely important to understand. Uh, none of us wants to do it, but the time in which we might do it, someone might do it, it would be very different. The circumstances would be very different. And in an emergency, people will ask for all sorts of things. Um, I think geoengineering may, invoke, may involve a, a number of actions by a number of different players. Uh, the big challenge for governance is going to get the countries most inclined to want to do it, not to do it. And because the one good thing is, a bit like with nuclear weapons, because uh, 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 one country wants others not to have it, they may accept a restraint on their own freedom to have it. That's how the nonproliferation system works, works imperfectly. But that's how it's, the, the logic of how it's supposed to work. And we're going to need something like that for geoengineering. Um, and the, the big thing to worry about is the more you try to re restrict what countries can do, the more the countries most likely to do it are going to just walk away. So what you actually want in an agreement is one that is, in a sense, very, uh, is least restrictive. It's very important you have the fullest participation possible. Thank you.
to give a reality check. <laughs> If you are to, oh, you. to pull CO2 out of the air, which I strongly advocate, you have to, as Scott said, it would be cheaper and, and faster to do it by geoengineering. That's putting it mildly. If you wanted to balance our emissions today and you used one ton a day units, which people are thinking about, you would need just to balance what we're doing today, 100 million of those. If you deployed them at the optimal spacing, it would take up the area of all of Arizona. So this is big stuff. If you wanted then to not only balance today's emissions, but also to bring CO, start bringing it down, if you made another 100 million of these, uh, it would um, <clears throat> bring CO2 down at about two parts per million, two and a half parts per million per year. Uh, so we wouldn't ever have the financial resources to bring CO2 down fast. So I think, I agree with Scott, like it or not, we've painted ourselves in a corner and we're going to have to use geoengineering to get through. Thank God I won't be here. <laughs> okay.